cold. Yeah, it's still snowing outside a little bit. Not much. Not much. But, uh, Time to shovel. It does at least look Break like a sweat. February 2nd. Happy Groundhog Day. Um, all right. We've had a very full show, and this, this topic, one that we've covered forever it's on this show. It's an ongoing deal. Um, is uh, continuing and developing, and I guess <coughs> the, the right question to ask Flint right now is, what is new about this week and the last couple of weeks as we once again delve into the horrors of uh, torture in Chicago police um, facilities for my entire lifetime? Well, quite a bit is new, unfortunately, I guess we could say. Yeah, um, right. We can start out with uh, what happened a couple days ago, which is in one of our torture cases, Cases. We uh, subpoenaed uh, Daly, Richard Daly, the former mayor. Couldn't happen to a nicer and guy. He was the state's attorney at the time. He was the state's attorney at, at the start, not even the start, but close to the start of the torture scandal, and he could have done something to stop it by prosecuting John Burge, and he didn't do that. Yep. Um, we sought he to didn't do that many times many, over. Oh, many times over. Yeah. And as a result, many, many men were tortured and sent to death row and, and otherwise uh, wrongfully convicted. Yeah. Anyway, uh, with regard to Daly, uh, we've been trying to get his testimony to find out exactly what he did and didn't know. And uh, he's got some very richly paid uh, city lawyers that taxpayers are paying for, of course. And they have, uh, I won't use the term on, on the air, but they've been messing us around quite a bit. <laughs> and finally we said no mas and we went to court on it this week to, to compel him to testify. I love when you do that, Flint. Now, which case was this? Is this Ron <laughs> Kitchen or Daryl Cannon? This is in Kitchen's case. Okay. Ronald Kitchen, who was on death row for 13 years, did 21 years in the penitentiary, was tortured by Burge, now has a certificate of innocence to prove that he wasn't guilty of the crimes he was charged and tortured for. Mm. Uh, this week as well, as you mentioned the name Daryl Cannon. Yeah. Daryl Cannon's another client of ours. Uh, Daryl Cannon was tortured at a remote site on the south side of Chicago by a couple of Burgess uh, henchmen, uh, uh, higher-ups in his uh, uh, ass-kickers, as they were known internally, uh, uh, by the name of Byrne and Dignan. Uh, he was tortured... Dignan or Degnan? Dignan, D-I. Okay. And, and, and Good Irish boy. Yes, very, yeah. very much so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, he was he was tortured, uh, given, gave a false confession, did 24 years in jail, and early in his case, he filed his own li civil lawsuit seeking damages. This was before the tor the uh, torture came out, and 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 we started to uncover it. Really, the city bought him out for three thousand dollars. Holy <laughs> so, smokers! So he got out uh, three, four years ago. Uh, 24 years in jail, and we filed a new suit saying that that original Sorry, suit couldn't uh, couldn't stand because it was the product of fraud, cover-up, conspiracy. The city has poured 1.8 million dollars into your the defense of your taxpayer dollars, That's folks, right, to defend a $3,000 verdict. Defending torturers, not paying for schools. That's get right. it? Get it? Yeah, we, they get it. Come yeah. on. Come on. So this case went all the way up to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, and um, I argued it last week, and the city sent their lawyer in, and the judge, or there's three judges in, in the Seventh Circuit that hear cases, and one of them is a, a very progressive judge by the name of Rovner, Judge Rovner. Right. And she spent the 15 minutes that the city had to argue grilling this guy about the cover-up. She said, and this is a quote, it's a miracle. I feel it's a miracle that this evidence has come out. She said, there's been cover-up, there's been fraud, there's been... And she just, her voice was like cracking. She yeah, was she so really upset by She really gave it to him, it seemed she like, did. in the story. Kind and, of love her. And, and hopefully we'll get a very strong opinion from the Seventh Circuit that'll say that Daryl Cannon deserves a new day in court because of the fact of this unbelievable cover-up by the city. Judge Rovner. Yes. Write her a letter. Say, keep on it, girl. <laughs> exactly. Of course, it is a female judge. but right, And then you mentioned uh, off air uh, Anita Alvarez, one of uh, everybody's, quote, favorites, unquote. Well, I just want to be clear. You know, she is the state's attorney, and she uh, was trained under the previous state's attorney. Uh, I actually... Uh, was presided over the Democratic Party meeting in the 49th Ward when she came as a candidate. And 
the things she said were basically, you know, like she was going to be kind of a reformed person. She has been nowhere near what she said she would do to uh, the group of uh, more progressive Democrats up here in the 49th Ward. Well, that's another new thing that's happening, uh, and it has to do with Alvarez, and that is that we filed, uh, along with Northwestern, uh, a lawsuit on behalf of the men that are still in the penitentiary, a class action. Who were uh, tortured. Yes, who were tortured How by How many Burge. of them are still in the Well, toilet. that's to be determined. Okay. and that's part of the case is to have a class action to determine all the men. It, it probably is somewhere between 15 and 30 uh, people that were directly tortured by Burge and his men who are still decades later in the penitentiary. And the lawsuit is against the state's attorney's office? Well, or? no, it's not against the state's or attorney's office. It is, uh, that's a good question, and that's why I brought up Alvarez's name, uh. because the question is who's going to defend the state uh, in, in, and prosecute these cases against the men. Right. And Devine, when he was state's attorney, Dick was Devine, uh, right. disqualified because he represented Because uh, he was there. <laughs> and, he, and, and he didn't do anything, and he was involved with Daly in the cover-up. Well, the judges have found that Alvarez is similarly conflicted. But now she's trying to get back in the cases, and in this particular case, uh, no doubt to try to derail the attempt to get these men new hearings on their allegations of torture. So she's saying, I'm not conflicted because... I'm not daily and I'm not divine divine but her uh, but she was there she was there and all of her people were there that's right and they were all involved in taking these tortured confessions they were all involved in putting on the torture evidence so the judges have rightly found in the past that Alvarez should not be involved but now she wants to come back in and it has to be decided again Wow. you know on a, on a similar note uh, you know the city continues to spend a lot of money defending these cases. And uh, we have a new mayor, uh, and he has not changed the tone of the higher-ups Yeah, is at there all. any indication from Emmanuel that... It's very mixed, it's very mis mixed signals. He okay. went, when we first uh, got Daly uh, named as a defendant in the cases, and it was such a large uh, Victory. Public, pu public issue, right, yeah. about a year and a half ago, um, Emmanuel came forward and said, I want to end this. But he hasn't ended it. Uh, he continues to fund the defense of Burge and Daly and all those people. And when we did settle one of the main cases, and not I, so ironically, it was the case in which Daly was supposed to testify, right. we and the people uh, in the community demanded that Emmanuel step up and apologize to the, the victims of torture and uh, a simple act, apologize to the African American community. He refused to do so. He's ah. refused to take a public position and get on the right side of history. He still funds the, the, the defense and he still allows some of these cases to c continue uh, and continues to defend Burge. And what's really remarkable about this, there's so many remarkable things about it, but even today we're uncovering new evidence of the just the the uh, the, the racism that that was behind all of this not that it's surprising but you know people's uh, detectives are now telling us thing about Burge's racism and city is now defending what is so inherently one of the most racist and deep conspiracies what is in undefensible history. it's indefensible. indefensible you know in the past uh, one of the one of the people and we're going to thank the the fifth estate is that the, the journalists uh, yeah. we want to thank John Conroy for all the work yes. that he did. Yeah. Um, Who we had uh, on this stage. Why don't you stage. tell us a little bit about his role, but also are there any people out there in the media who are really taking this on? Do you well, have any new allies? Yeah. Well, Because John is not writing for the uh, no, reader anymore. No, he's not, and we all know why, because he was too good at what he did. Yeah. He was a dying breed of investigative reporters, and what he did in this case was when we were trying the Andrew Wilson torture cases in the late 80s, right. John covered it. He went to court every day, so he knew what the evidence was that we were uncovering at that time, and he wrote a series of articles in the reader, investigative articles, over over a decade, which exposed all of this, and then he went on to, to do a wonderful play than right. many of us saw uh, yeah, uh, at great. the Timeline Theater. Yeah. And so John has been a, a real uh, pioneer in all of this and been standing right beside us and all the activists. He's a hero. He is. And there are 
very few uh, people in the media that really cover this anymore. Although Carol Marine, she has done quite a bit with it. Uh, it, it is starting to, to, to have some kind of weight in, in the national media. I mean, as some of the, the Sun Times has editorialized numerous times about ending the torture struggle. Well, Flint, you and the People's Law Office have been the real heroes in this for for decades. <laughs> right after you finished the. Uh, Winning some sort of uh, redress of grievances for the Hampton family, et cetera, and from Mark the Clark. trade, uh, from the raid, rather, um, you you stepped right into this. Uh, had well, they had a few things in between. Well, you had a lot of. You've always, but you've been Not the the people who kept the their feet to the fire. Um, how can citizens like me and the folks listening who are outraged that our tax dollars are defending these racist bullies, torturers, what would you suggest or have you seen any sign of the kind of organizing required from the grassroots voters saying, cease and desist. We do not want to defend these guys. Right. I, I think that the real issue with regard to the money is that the money should go to the victims of, uh, of torture rather than to the lawyers. And in fact, that's, that's the issue that, that we have pushed. There should be reparations for the men who were tortured who don't have cases in court. Uh, and that these lawyers who have now made over $20 million of taxpayers' money, uh, sh they should stop that. City Council could stop that. They could, City Council could. They could. City Council could. If they could. had a spine, you they, mean. That, well, um, you said that, I didn't. But, I did. Uh, <laughs> and I'll say it again. What did you say? If they have a spine. <laughs> I, yeah. I know the, the alderman up here, uh, Joe Moore, has from time to time stepped forward and other times hasn't. Uh, yeah. This yep. point that seems that all the aldermen don't want to offend Rahm Emanuel, even the ones who in the past were our supporters, uh, don't really want to step out and say, let's end this right now. And I I think we, as, as you said, we need to, we need to have new city council hearings if these torture cases aren't resolved. Why isn't Rahm Emanuel stepping forward to fight to stop the pension of John Burge that he's still collecting while he Thank sits you. in Butner next to uh, Bernie Madoff and all the other Thank criminals? Uh, why is the city uh, still defending these people? They, I can give you a list of, of questions uh, that need to be answered. Apologies, uh, I'd like reparations. Those these are things that need to be raised. The city, uh, is spearheaded by Joe Moore, passed a no torture resolution, right. but it has no teeth. Right. People have to make that reality. You can't say no torture in Chicago and then allow the Burge cases to go on. It's right. just a contradiction there that can't be uh, can't be um, dealt with. It has to be dealt with. Yeah. Flint, have uh, behind the scenes, is there any discussion about anyone who might take on Alvarez in the next election? I mean, a lot of people don't seem to, you know, she got elected, uh, it was Not kind of putting wave. it on this show brings it in front of the scenes, necessarily. Right. <laughs> she got elected, you know, when it was kind of a wave of women uh, winning office and uh, some change happened. But what what do you think's happened? Is there a chance that someone might take her well, on? Well, it would be good if someone did. I, if we look back at the last election, it was a classic progressive shooting themselves in the foot because there were two relatively good candidates, right. Larry Sufferden and Howard Brookins. And and together they got more votes obviously than she did but the, it was the old split split them up and conquer type of thing and I just uh, spoke to Larry Sufferton two days ago he's gonna be on this show in the next couple of weeks oh good there yeah. you go. well, we'll ask him about that yeah. again now I want to ask you there's a lot of uh, press about our former governor Ryan and uh, you know they always talk about how can he, you believe there was the a bunch coverage of, of him getting out of jail well I think week? it's really great that he got some coverage because I and, but I think and the two things are said about him one did he was convicted because of uh, various graft and given his buddies payoffs, et cetera, et cetera. But the other thing is the legacy of him uh, letting a lot of people off of death row right. and putting in place the um, uh, no death penalty in the state of Illinois. Uh, what do you think is his legacy? Um, because, you know, despite some of the things he did, I will always honor that guy and would love to have him on this show yeah, to talk about uh, the death penalty because, you know, he did a great thing. Yeah, I did. have a tremendous amount of respect for him. Here's a downstate Republican. Uh, one of the first things he had to do uh, when he was in office was to pull the switch on, on, on a man on death row. He did it once, but then he started to think about it. And then he issued the moratorium when, when, when the Anthony Porter case was put right, to him right. in 2000. And then 
on his way out. He, as you said, he, he pardoned four. Not only did he clear death row and, 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 and commit, commute to uh, life without parole, but in four instances of police torture, he pardoned those men. Those yeah. men were actually released. And that gave us a springboard to carry forward and, 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 and get more evidence of police torture. And I think I, I wrote this in, in an article that was published w on, uh, w in The Nation, and that is there was a tremendous connection between the movement to uh, end the death penalty and the, the, the fight against police torture. And when those two movements came together, that gave the critical mass to what, what happened in, in both in the death penalty and in the, in the torture uh, struggle. And uh, Governor Ryan, uh, although it was the movement that moved him, uh, he did it. He did and it. He did it, no. and I, I have a we tremendous... We can't take that away from that him. That has to be his legacy and from my point of view. In Absolutely. connection with that, uh, there's a lot of credit given around the death penalty changes uh, to the Northwestern students and the professor that was involved. I'm mm -hmm. blocking his name. Uh, Larry Marshall was one of them, certainly. It, there's a protest. couple of them. So a protest yeah. was the... Yeah. So where are they at? I mean, they were some... Uh, pushback from Alvarez on trying to stop them from doing this kind of uh, expose work. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what do you know about that? Well, um, the, those weren't the same. Obviously, they're different students, but, but day protest went, went on and was actually driven out of Northwestern uh, because of some of the cases that he was dealing with. And uh, now he has an innocence project and he's continued to deal with cases of innocence. And uh, that Anita Alvarez went after those students and attempted to, uh, to instead of dealing with the innocence issues in the cases, went after the students who had helped to develop the evidence of, uh, of innocence, and, and that, that's a, another really dark spot on her on her record, and it makes Amen. me completely distrustful of her and her motives. Did you watch her on 60 Minutes? Uh, I, I <laughs> haven't, but I heard she well, was. It's really you know, terrible. She was, was an embarrassing the, moment for Ms. Alvarez. And those were a couple of... I, actually, I'm involved in both of those cases as one of the lawyers, one of the many lawyers, and she should have kept... I, my advice to her would have been, uh, don't, uh, don't, uh, don't talk. <laughs> because don't talk. the more she opened her mouth, the uh. worse she looked. Those cases are so obviously innocence cases, and anybody who had half a brain and half a heart would know that those kids were all innocent and framed by the Chicago Instead, and the Dixmore Instead, she starts talking police. about necrophilia. Oh, man. What a I mean, goofball. Flynn, we got two minutes left. Tell us what's, uh, what we're missing. What's going on, whether in Chicago or out in the world, uh, that people should be paying attention to? Well, there's so many justice issues out there, Michael and Kath, Katie, as you know. And uh, this, But the torture issues, the death penalty issues here in the city really highlight some of the outrageous nature of, of it. And I want to I mention, too, that when we talk about torture, we're not just talking about the kind of torture that, that happens happened under Burge, electric shock, baggings, you know, the kind of things that happen around the world. Uh, we're also talking about prisons. We're talking about uh, supermax prisons. Thank we're you. talking about uh, super isolation. That, that's all torture. Yeah. And there's all new forms of torture. Then, you know, there's the taser that's being used. There's all sorts of kinds of uh, techniques that are used in prison. So we have to broaden our view of what torture is. And in, if we do that, we need to be demanding not only that Burge and them be brought to justice uh, and that the mayor stop defending all of this, but that we look more broadly into, into what this country and, and this state and this city does with regard to all forms of torture. So it is a good thing that Quinn shut down TAMS? Yes, yeah. definitely a good thing. And yeah. Definitely a good thing that he signed. The that was another wonderful victory two years ago, uh, ending the death penalty. And that, was, that, was a, that, that makes Illinois uh, an example in the same way that putting Burge in the penitentiary makes Illinois and Chicago an example of how you can, in struggles, win and have victories and come and, and actually give examples to people on how to struggle against these awful injustices. Could be. Quinn's legacy too. Well, I want to I want to thank you, Flint Taylor, and all the people so out there in the world doing good, uh, at, particularly over there at the People's Law Office. Um, you do great work. Uh, are you working out? You're staying in shape. You look good. I want to <laughs> make sure great. you stick around for Stay a long with time. Us. That's right. I got to run in the next race uh, over here. I keep uh, it's too early for me, man. Have it at noontime. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah but, we should have a noontime race. Yeah. I, I'm I'm with that. But people want to get more history um, in terms of what we've done in our cases.
peopleslawoffice.com. We have a pretty good website. We've got a lot of stuff on there. And Michael and Katie, I want to say one thing in closing. You mentioned the Hampton case. As you know, one of the, one of the great people in that oh, case Doc. who survived, Doc Satchel, Doc Satchel just and he just heart. passed away. And bless I just want him. Him, um, to, to say yeah. something and let people we know. We should talk more there. about Doc Satchel in the, in the whole Black Panther thing <laughs> in What a wonderful shows. person. Really? Yeah, I did get those emails. And uh, they were people who were looking for some dough to help with his burial. Right. Um, right. Yes. I want to thank everybody who, uh, who makes this show possible. There's a long list. I'm not going to give them all. Uh, next week, we are going to have... Uh, Ami Tyler talking about her dad and mom's beautiful art. Um, uh, coming up on the 16th, we're going to have the Urban Twang folks. And I do want to call special attention to our show on March 2nd. We're going to have an old buddy of mine, Mark Smith, who uh, wrote a book called, uh, about, basically about uh, uh, Japan and the United States. And we're going to have the literary March Madness people, Russ Bradbird and Mike Lenahan. Uh, doing a lot of great talking about basketball. So, do good in the world. The world needs all the good you can do. All power to the people. Over and out.